and then pass this over to Jackie Bennett with Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries to get us started. Thank you, Robin, um, and welcome everyone. We're gonna get started now. I am Jackie Bennett, Program Director for, An for Africa and Asia at the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, or GFAS. Um, GFAS has a mission to help sanctuaries help animals through our accreditation program, and also through events like these where we can bring people together to share their experience and expertise. For this webinar, we're really happy to present this in partnership with the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance, or PASA, and Jean Fleming, PASA's communications manager, joins me today, and you will hear from her in just a few minutes. Now, when we started to develop this webinar, we realized it would be important to begin by talking about what a sanctuary is and what we mean by ethical tourism. So what is a sanctuary? This is GFAS's definition of sanctuary, a facility that provides temporary or permanent safe haven to animals in need while meeting the principles of true sanctuary. Um, now, this is in some respects a broad definition beyond how some might think of an animal sanctuary. It includes not only facilities that give lifetime home to animals, but also rescue centers, which may have animals in permanent care, but also care for certain species that may be adopted out to the public, such as some farmed animals or equines. Our definition of sanctuary also covers rehabilitation centers that care for wildlife to prepare them for a return to the wild. And that may be short-term care, or as in the instance of many ape centers, it may be a period for a period of years as young orphaned animals are, are taught survival skills to prepare them for life in the wild. This definition of sanctuary guides our work and the kinds of facilities that may become GFAS accredited. But we also refer to true sanctuaries. And these are the practices and principles that would apply whether we are talking about permanent or temporary care and regardless of the species. Now, while some centers may use the term sanctuary or even conservation center in their names, this isn't what makes them a true sanctuary. In short, true sanctuaries don't engage in practices that exploit animals. And this will include not selling animals or otherwise engaging in the commercial trade of animals or their parts, not breeding animals in captivity unless part of a bona fide breeding for release program, not allowing the visiting public to have direct contact with wild animals and not allowing any kind of invasive research that harms animals or prevents them from engaging in natural behaviors. Uh, behavioral research studies would be acceptable. Now we don't wanna suggest that true sanctuaries can't allow visitors, whether that be on tours or through volunteer programs. Sanctuaries can engage in tourism and even ask for visitor fees to raise revenue for their work, if this is done ethically. So what is ethical animal tourism? True sanctuaries will act in the best interest of the animals when planning and offering visitor opportunities. And depending on the sanctuary's location and other circumstances, any number of factors should be considered, but here are some basics. First, the animals and their welfare come first. So animals aren't being trained to do tricks or to perform for the public. They remain free to engage in natural behaviors and should be able to retreat from public view if that is their choice. Visitor programs can be an opportunity to educate about the root causes that bring animals into captivity and why sanctuaries needed, why sanctuaries need funding and how we can change our behaviors so we are contributing to the exploitation of animals. Safety is also important both for animals and humans. This means visitors shouldn't have direct contact with wild animals to prevent injury and also to reduce the risk of disease transmission. And finally, true sanctuaries won't offer what we call those pay to play activities. Uh, simply put, elephants don't need to have visitors ride them. Lion cubs don't need visitors to hold them and take selfies. These kinds of activities can be harmful to animals and they also have the potential to fuel the illegal wildlife trade by furthering a perception that wild animals make appropriate pets. Now, this is just a quick overview. Uh, GFAS does have a full position statement on uh, visitation for sanctuaries on our website and we'd be happy to email it to you if you'd like. 
Today, we'll hear from some sanctuaries about how they have designed their visitor programs. And while we have called this webinar the Sanctuary Perspective, we'll also hear the volunteer experience and the perspective of the tourism industry as well. But before I introduce our speakers, I'm gonna turn it over to Jean for a few minutes. So let me stop sharing and give it to you. All right. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Uh, greetings from beautiful Greece, where I live. Uh, it's great to be with you today. And thank you so much for taking time to be with us so that we can share some stories and learn more about uh, what it takes to have an ethical experience uh, if you love wild animals. Um, PASA, the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance, just a, a note about who we are. We are the largest alliance of uh, wildlife sanctuaries and um, wildlife centers in Africa. We've got 23 members now across 13 different countries. Uh, our primary focus is primates, as you can probably guess from all the different logos of our members. Um, however, many of them rescue and care for uh, many other animals. Uh, Gray, what, gray parrots that are quite endangered, pangolins, uh, all, all, all kinds of beasts. Um, let's see, yeah, there we go. Uh, we have kind of two ways that we work, um, and that is at the macro level, trying to work across the, the region and internationally on the really big issues that are causing so many uh, animals in need of rescue. So things like habitat loss and climate change, wildlife trafficking, as Jackie just mentioned, um, all of those issues, our members live and breathe them every day, as I'm sure you're about to hear from some of them. Um, and we do uh, try to run programs that uh, address those in the, at the, the macro level as much as we can and working with them um, to take advantage of their incredible experience and relationships on the ground. And then, of course, uh, animal welfare is the other side of the work, which is making sure that there's a very high standard of care in place for all, all of the animals that are in care through PASA member sanctuaries, uh, whether that's uh, briefly or for several years or for a lifetime, um, which with the great apes can be 40, 50 years. Uh, so it's, it really is uh, a lifetime. Um, and we have, uh, we're proud to employ almost 800 people across Africa. We don't, we don't employ them directly, our members do. Uh, they return about $6 million into the economies there locally and have uh, had incredible impact on conserving wildland. So we're very proud of the work they do and excited for you to hear from them. So I'm gonna stop sharing and stop talking and hand it back to Jackie. Thank you, Jean. And now uh, we're going to welcome our speakers. Um, so first I want to say thank you to our speakers for taking time from their schedules to join our webinar today. Karine Zabo is the ecotourism manager for Takugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary in Sierra Leone, which is a PASA member. Karine, originally from Israel, has a bachelor's degree in social work from Tel Aviv University and a master's in international community development from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She joined the Takugama team in August of 2020, which was during lockdown, so a bit challenging. And her work involves finding a balance in providing an enjoyable stay for those visiting from abroad, while at the same time helping to improve the lives of those who live locally, and of course, always giving consideration first to the needs and welfare of the animals at the sanctuary. And we'll hear about that today. Anna Bryant is biology coordinator and volunteer manager at Arcus Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation Center in Guatemala, a GFAS accredited facility. Anna worked in zoos in New Zealand and Australia before gaining her Bachelor of Science in Zoology. She came to Arcus first as a volunteer and has stayed on as a member of staff for the last 11 years. She supervises the day-to-day -day management of volunteers, as well as raising many orphan baby animals received from the illegal wildlife trade. She's also responsible for the behavioral studies of the rehabilitated animals to determine if they're ready to be released, as well as post-release monitoring in the field. Anna was awarded the GFAS Carol Newell Award last year for her work with Arcus. 
Tiffany James is a zookeeper at Zoo Knoxville, located in Tennessee in the US. She recently earned her master's degree focusing on primate conservation education from Miami University and serves on PASA's social media team. Last year, she traveled to Old Kejita Conservancy in Kenya as an animal care volunteer, and she's currently volunteering with PASA Member Sanctuary Colobus Conservation in Kenya, where she's joining us from today. And finally, Daniel Turner is an environmental biologist who has worked with the global travel industry for almost two decades, initially as tourism lead at Born Free Foundation, and most recently as director of the specialist consultancy at Amundio. Taking a more pragmatic approach, he's been at the forefront of travel industry guidance and policy development and advocates animal friendly travel where tourism is part of the solution. And Daniel is joining us today from the UK. And if I can just advance one more slide. Uh, just as a reminder, we'll answer questions at the end of all presentations. But if you have questions as you listen, please submit them and we'll try to get to each of them at the end. And now I'm going to turn it over to Corrine, our first speaker, and I am going to be sharing her slides. So let me just pull them up. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Karin Zabo. Uh, as I was introduced, I'm the ecotourism manager at the Kugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary. Um, as was presented before me, ethical tourism refers to the traveling, um, refers to traveling while considering the impact of the travel on the surrounding communities, the environment, and the local community economy. In the next 10 minutes or less, <laughs> I will share with you how your visit to the Kazgama Chimpanzee Sanctuary can make an impact. So just briefly about the Kugama, we can move to the next slide. Uh, the Kugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary was founded in uh, 1995 by uh, Mr. Bala Amsekaran, um, still the director of the sanctuary, together with the government of Sierra Leone and um, by the EU uh, seed funding that was given at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, in 2006, uh, 2006, the Kugama built the first Eco Lodge, Bruno, named after the first uh, uh, chimpanzee in the sanctuary. Um, at the beginning, it was uh, the Eco Lodge was a facility for volunteers, and then uh, we developed the ecotourism uh, department. In 20, uh, 2010, the Kugama opened its first outreach department, um, basing on the on the idea that more and more chimpanzees are coming to the sanctuary and um, we wanted to have an alternative not only to treat them here but also to uh, try and um, really focus on the problem itself and not only receiving them. So we started the outreach department, working together uh, with the communities that live in high proximity to wild chimpanzees in the wild. Um, through education, awareness raising, income generation activities, and research. All right. So all registered as an agency under the Wildlife Division of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry. The Kugama does not receive any funding from the government of Sierra Leone. We raise funding through private and institutional donors uh, to fund the care of the chimps and our conservation efforts. We develop the ecotourism component while looking to diversify our funding and to create a more self-sustaining funding model. In 2019, we reached a peak where we funded 60% out of the costs, um, the operational costs by the ecotourism activities. Uh, funding is not the only reason to develop ecotourism at the Kugama. We also run educational sanctuary tours to raise awareness with Sierra Leoneans and international visitors about the situation of the chimpanzees here in Sierra Leone what the Kugama is doing to protect them, and how can they join the conservation efforts. So the activities we run here is ecologies. We have six uh, beautiful ecologies in the forest, sanctuary tours, hikes and forest walks, uh, bird watching, 
events such as yoga retreats, dinners, live music, and we rent the venue space as well for different workshops and uh, events. The volunteer program also helps uh, to fund the care of the chimpanzees and our outreach activities. It is also established to enable skilled professionals to share their expertise and relevant knowledge. Based on their expertise and interests, volunteers can practice different fields of intervention, intervention, such as outreach and community development, building and maintenance, enrichment, enrichment preparations, marketing and communication, ecotourism, education, operations, animal care, and welfare, or in other words, any help we can get. So the successes so far of uh, the ecotourism here at the Kugama, um, we were chosen as number one attraction in TripAdvisor. Um, and the bigger success may be uh, following on from a visit by Jen Goodall. The chimpanzee was declared as the national animal of Sierra Leone in 2019 by the president and the face of tourism by the minister of tourism. Sierra Leone is the first and only country in the world to have a great ape as its official national animal. And we learned that other countries in Africa have shown the benefit that wildlife-focused tourism can have on a country's economy, such as the case of gorillas tourism in Rwanda that shows that strategic and effective, effective ecotourism establishment can go hand in hand with nationwide development of infrastructure, transportation, banking, clinics, and job, job description. Our vision to, for the ecotourism at the Kugama. Um, so besides the activities that we have here uh, within the sanctuary, we are looking to expand uh, our work to communities that we work with that live in high proximity to chimpanzees in the wild and to enable them with alternative livelihood and income generation activities. We found that ecotourism activities could be kind of a good solution um, and create a motivation to protect the forest because this is where uh, the income can come from. All right. So what can be the impact of visiting Takugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary? Um, the impact of your travel and your actions while traveling on the surrounding communities and their environment and the local economy, right? This is how we, we are looking at ecotourism, at ethical tourism. So first, all the profits are used for the care of the chimps and the conservation efforts. Um, job creation, Kugama is employing directly 55 staff members within the sanctuary and other uh, biomonitors with the communities that we work with. Uh, with building the capacity of staff, staff members from nearby communities and strengthening their relationship with them. We are raising the awareness of Sierra Leoneans of the international community to the situation of the chimpanzee in Sierra Leone and the efforts that we all need to take in order to protect them. Um, we also find that volunteers and visitors that stayed in Takugama uh, got, uh, wanted to engage more and they're also fundraising for Takugama uh, for the chimpanzees. But when we look at, um, at the impact we have in the world, it's not only positive, right? Even if we have the best intentions in mind. So ethical tourism doesn't mean only doing good while traveling, but also means taking into consideration the consequences of our traveling. Um, ecotourism in Takugama has also the risk for uh, negative impact on the communities, the chimpanzees the, that are within the sanctuary and the wild chimpanzees around and other animals in the national park and their environment. We find that tourism activities increase the interaction between people and animals 
and as such, risks of zoonotic diseases are increasing. More specifically, COVID, but also other diseases that can transfer from people to chimps and the other way around. Uh, we also find that a lot of visitors, volunteers, they come with a fantasy of holding a baby chimp. Um, and orphan chimpanzees, as you know, uh, such as orphan humans, they went through traumatic experiences and so the separation from the mom and the group might create changes in their attachment and as such their behavior. Having different mom figures uh, can only worsen the change in their, in their behavior. Also ongoing human pres presence might stress the chimps, disturb the normal behavior, such as uh, throwing rocks at uh, visitors, which is a very common practice with some of our chimps. Um, in other cases, chimps are getting used to seeing people, which may slow down the rehabilitation process. We also see that sanctuary tours can change not only the behavior of uh, not only with, sorry the behavior of the chimps, but also their nutritional diet, as the care staff are calling the chimps to the fence uh, with treats, so that the visitors can see them. Give them extra color, giving them extra calories, and uh, changing their uh, normal behavior patterns. And of course, cars, noise, uh, the infrastructure of the lodges, uh, all of them can have a negative impact on the habitat of the wild chimpanzees and other animals in the environment. Important to say that we are located in a national park. Um, and then ecotourism activities can create um, higher use of natural resources such as water, firewood, electricity, etc. So what we are um, always thinking is how we mitigate the risk and minimize the negative impact that the eco tourism can have uh, on Takugama's chimps and the environment. So first of all, and I think maybe the most relevant is the COVID regulations we put for staff, volunteers, visitors, um, such as hand washing, wearing masks. Uh, it is compulsory within the sanctuary. We minimize the size of the group in every sanctuary tour. Um, and then also, um, Every time that uh, Sierra Leone has experienced a COVID uh, wave, we had to close the sanctuary uh, to protect the chimps. Um, we have said that only the surrogate mom, such as Malfi in this uh, beautiful photo, and the care staff are the ones that come in contact with the chimps. Uh, we are setting the expectations in place for visitors and volunteers that are coming uh, with this fantasy or idea of uh, caring immediately for the chimps. Um, for the change in behavior and nutrition, uh, we have set four daily tours that will fit the already existing feeding hours. So then we minimize the changes in nutrition and the behavior of the chimps. Um, and then we also have most of the chimps uh, are in forest enclosures or where they can also hide if they want from visitors and not be uh, so much in uh, communication. And for the, in, uh, the change in environment, we are looking for green solutions to run the sanctuary. Uh, we actually are in the process of installing a big um, solar system uh, to minimize the use of a generator. So then um, I just shared uh, a comment here from uh, TripAdvisor, but I would, uh, I think you guys can read, but I would like to share uh, a story with you about a kid uh, named Ibrahim from Sierra Leone who visited the sanctuary uh, with his uh, 
school. He came for a sanctuary tour and he learned about the chimpanzee and that it's illegal to have them kept as pets. And then a few months after the visit, we got a phone call from Ibrahim telling us that there is a chimpanzee that is kept in his, uh, in his village. And then collecting information, uh, we went to rescue the chimp and he's, uh, this is Jackie, one of the chimpanzees in the guardianship program here at Akugama. So we see that raising awareness uh, can have a bigger impact um, and the visit here can have a bigger impact that we can imagine. And that's it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to keep it short, but uh, to learn more about the Kugama, uh, you can uh, see our website, email us, and there's many ways to support, come and visit, volunteer, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Karine. That was a great presentation. Um, just some examples of all of the positive benefits of ethical tourism at sanctuaries, but all of the considerations um, to avoid the negative consequences. And now we're going to turn it over to another sanctuary perspective with Anna Bryant. Hi there. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Let me see if that works, sorry. Cool. So um, my name is Anna. I'm the volunteer manager and biology coordinator here in North Guatemala at Arcus Wildlife Rescue and Rehabilitation Center. So our goal is release through rescue and rehabilitation center, re rehabilitation processes, sorry. And so we get animals like this, and this is where we're wanting to leave them baby monkeys back in the forest where they belong. So the illegal trade is, is huge here. And so we receive so many baby or young animals like shown in the previous slide. And through our rehab processes, we're then able to release them back into the wild with those necessary skills that they have or they have to have in order to survive. But sadly, most of our animals are from this illegal wildlife trade. So Arcus was established over 30 years ago, specifically to deal with the results of this trade. And so each year we can receive hundreds of animals from over 40 different species. And so it's, it's generally called the wildlife trade or the illegal pet trade. So this is where people from all over the world are wanting to have a baby parrot in their house or a baby monkey or what have you. Sadly, this is where these animals are from. So they're from Guatemala and have to be poached from where they live and distributed out throughout the world. So to give you a little bit of an example, that photo on the left is just one parrot confiscation. And so we received 109 baby parrots just in one confiscation on one night. And so it's, it's just an enormous industry. And here at the center, we see, we're pretty much at the front line. So we see what the harsh reality is. And although we do receive mostly parrots, we can also receive baby jaguars, monkeys, crocodiles, turtles, pretty much any sort of species you can think of that live here, sadly gets caught up in this trade. At the moment, we have just under 600 animals on site, and that's actually quite a low number for us. So normally we have over 600, almost to 700. We've done luckily a lot of releases last year, and that number's come down a bit and it will pick up again with parrot breeding season in the next couple of months. And so with the illegal trade, sometimes it's not so easy to identify. And so it's often easy to get caught up with the live animals, the live pets, but the legal wildlife trade actually incorporates a big broad spectrum of thing, including even plants uh, and wood and flowers. And so one of the things which we um, talk about with our volunteers, I'm gonna talk about a volunteer program in a little while, um, is to be very aware of what they're buying. So what you're getting when you're going to different countries, be very aware of, of what they're, they're looking at in shops and souvenir shops, because it can be different laws, different legal rules in each country in each state. And it's sometimes not very obvious. So obviously you've got a, blatant armadillo made into a purse there, but it can be something as small as feathers, as shells, as something that looks like plastic, which is actually turtle shell. And so it's being, just being responsible when traveling and 
not unwittingly helping to force this, this demand for the illegal wildlife trade um, as they're traveling and doing it completely innocently, just being very, very aware of what's going on. So our center is actually divided into two parts. So we have our rescue center, which is where the majority of our animals are, and that's where all our releasable animals are. However, sadly, we're always going to have some that we can't release uh, for various reasons. And so what we have is an actual educational area. And so with our rescue center with the release of animals, we don't allow visitors. We have our volunteer program, but no visitors are allowed there in case they harm, harm the, the process of that rehabilitation. However, with the re unreleasable animals, we can have them with visitors. And so we've opened this area, which means that these animals that aren't able to be released actually become ambassadors for their species. And it's educating visitors about the actual very, very harsh realities of the illegal wildlife trade. Um, and the repercussions that are sometimes very long term. So we have in that first photo is actually our entrance area. So it looks a little bit like a temple. And so what we do is we actually force every single visitor, they have to go through this area. And this is where all our educational sort of focus is. And so it's really, really focused on the illegal wildlife trade. But not only that, it also incorporates the biodiversity of Guatemala, as well as looking at, at different aspects. And we've really branched out and looked at how best to interact people, because often people won't just read a, a slide or a slide or something. So we're looking at sort of different technology. So all throughout the center, we have augmented reality. And in this main educational area, we actually have a virtual reality room. And so through that, we've made this virtual reality sort of area where people are transported to, to a Mayan rainforest to be able to see these animals in the wild. And then we have hunters and poachers come through and them to actually physically see the, the very, very blatant um, responses to that and how awful that can be. On the other side, we're also able to use those virtual realities um, masks and rooms to show some of our releases, which were filmed in 180 degrees. So it can go from seeing that very, very harsh reality to the hope of this is what actually can be done. There are, there are ways to change this. Um, and so it's really trying to show both sides. And so visitors will go through this before they've seen any animals. And so when they do pass in front of these animals, it's with the, with the knowledge and with the idea that these are all victims of the illegal trade. These should be free, but they're not because of people, because of all of these different reasons. And so it hopefully changes that mentality um, and educates a lot more people who may not be aware of it. But volunteers is why we're generally here today. And so we have a very long running volunteer program. So it's been going for the past almost 30 years where volunteers from all around the world can come to the center and, and volunteer with us. There can be anything from a couple of weeks, a couple of months to even several years in some cases who very long-term volunteers. So each volunteer are allocated specific enclosures where they're then responsible for those animals there. So they're responsible for the food preparation, the cleaning, the feeding, observations of those animals and become really big part of the centre. Um, one of the most important things is we're incredibly hands off with these animals. We have very strict no talking rules. Um, there's no playing with the animals. There's no unnecessary interaction. If there is any needed necessary um, interaction, for example, with um, force feeding some animals or the movements, then it's always under very strict veterinary um, supervision. It's never unnecessary. So it doesn't affect the long-term process of these animals and affect their chance of being free again. Volunteers here not only can gain valuable experience with the animals, but they also learn firsthand about wildlife conservation and our rehabilitation process, how long and how actually in-depth those processes are. It's not just as simple as opening up a cage and, and off those animals go. It's often a years and years of, of processes for them. Um, and they also learn about the illegal wildlife trade. When we do have releases, and we have releases on site sometimes, volunteers are encouraged to be part of that. So they can come and either be the ones opening the doors or being the ones see these animals be free again. And that's such an incredible experience um, to see firsthand that it changes a lot of people's um, way of life and way of thinking of things to be able to have that special experience. 
And over the years, we've actually been able to have quite a lot of return volunteers, which is just wonderful. Uh, we've actually got one at the moment now from Quebec. Uh, she was here about five years ago. And um, so we've been going through all the animals that she used to work with when she was here and all of them have been released. And so that's just wonderful for her to be able to, to know that she was part of helping those animals be free again. Um, not only that, we also have a veterinary program. And so this was established about six years ago and is open for vet students around the world, again, wanting to gain hands-on experience with wildlife medicine, because it can be quite difficult to gain that experience. And so those are two week structured courses with the vets and with myself. And it's normally with a lecture and then followed with a practical. So you can utilize the, the skills that you've gained in that theoretical um, lecture. And so we do one on citizens, on small mammals, one on primates, one on reptiles, and one of the importance of environmental enrichment, not only in a captive animal situation, but in rehabilitation processes as well. And so these programs help teach a new generation of vet veterinarians how to correctly handle these animals, how to correctly manage them, um, all the different skills that is needed but also teaches the highs and lows of this wildlife medicine, because you will always get those contrasts and you will always see those sort of tough times and harsh realities. And we want these, this new generation of veterinarians to be able to help these, this wildlife in the future, whether it's here in Guatemala or in their own countries, it's helping those just increase the knowledge that they have here. Without these two programs, and we know from the last few years with COVID, um, it would be incredibly difficult for our center to survive. We depend on the funds that these volunteers uh, provide us so that we can survive. We obviously have other fundings, but volunteer and vet programs is our main, main source. And so if we didn't have them, we wouldn't be able to do the, the important work that we do. And what we often, often talk to with volunteers, they ask about what sort of other sanctuaries or rescue centers they can go to. It's just do research, do your research, find out what the goals of the centers are like, find out what their um, what their protocols are out because there's so many worthwhile centers around that take volunteers and they desperately need help and value the help as opposed to just being a photo opportunity. So again, thank you for listening. Um, if there's anyone that's interested in, in volunteering or wants more information about what we do, obviously those are our, um, our contact information and thank you. Thank you, Anna, that was fantastic. I definitely wanna visit your virtual reality room, but it's so important to hear about the kinds of experiences that volunteers can have and how those experiences impact their lives. And so it's appropriate now to hear from a volunteer. So I'll turn it over to Tiffany James. Hi everybody, my name is Tiffany Joe. Just uh, send me a comment if it cuts out and I can uh, make it work. <laughs> um, so my experience and presentation is a little bit different. I'm going to be talking about my personal volunteer experiences at different sanctuaries and just some general advice that I have for you all. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let me know. There we go. Can you see my screen okay? I see your screen, Tiffany. I'm not seeing the slides yet. I'm seeing like the screen uh, options you have. It's working. I'm not seeing any comments yet. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and present. Um, they're working, they're trying oh. to come up. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Hopefully it's working. So it's loading on here. Sorry about that, guys. No problem, you're calling in from a long way away. Mm. Okay, <laughs> this is loading on my end, so. Um. Oops. I may need to have uh, somebody share my slides for me, if that's all right. Okay, thank you, sorry about that. All right, I'll go ahead and go back to the screen and stop sharing. 
There we go. All right. And Jackie, are you right. able you to be seeing me now? <laughs> Sorry, this guy's. So one of the. <laughs> Yeah. Tiffany, why don't you get started with introducing yourself? I need to I will find your slides. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, my name is Tiffany. I work at Do Knoxville currently in Tennessee, and I've been volunteering with CASA since 2016. Um, and I recently, last year, started. It looks like we lost her connection. It, uh, yes, it looks like we did. Um, Daniel, do you want to start your presentation? And then if Tiffany can join again, we'll we'll have her slides ready for her. Yeah, sure. I can uh, get in here, then, no problem. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, yes, I can see that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and Tiffany, we'll we'll have you go after Daniel because I'm pulling up your slides. Sounds good. I figured I'd join from a different. Okay. Hour. So good. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, sorry, Tiffany. We'll 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 look at the tourism aspect and then come back to you. Uh, Sounds good. So, sorry, I cut out. So hi everyone. Um, my name's Daniel Turner, as was previously mentioned by Jackie. Uh, I'm the co-founder and director of Animundial. We are a consultancy that works in conjunction with the travel and tourism sector to help them navigate the complexities of um, working with animals, but also working within the natural environment as well and mitigating any risk um, wherever possible. So what I want to do is to provide um, the tourism industry's perspective on uh, animal sanctuaries. And this certainly differs depending on the type of travel and tourism business, uh, their operational principles, um, and also how they operate within their supply chain, how they work with the suppliers within that supply chain. Um, so animal sanctuaries certainly are considered and included within um, travel and tourism. Um, they're often preferred uh, over zoos and marine parks because the assumption is that they provide the best care and the best practice. Um, and the experiences that um, people, uh, it, that people are uh, subjected to in these places uh, generally vary in incredibly um, and um, you know while some of them uh, definitely do provide genuine um, at quality care others are very much uh, only sanctuaries in name uh, rather than in operation and as you can see from the slides in uh, in front of you uh, the pictures in front of you uh, all of these are taken in facilities that are communicated to the industry, to the travel industry as sanctuaries. Um, and it's in the name uh, of, of, the, of, of the facility. But as you can see, they offer very different types of experiences. And certainly when I started working with the travel and tourism uh, community, uh, many years ago, um, there was a lack of understanding um, as to what is an animal sanctuary and how uh, these differ from zoological collections. And certainly uh, a, a minimal minimum of understanding in relation to the practices that differentiate them. So uh, what we did, um, and this was when I was working at um, uh, an NGO, we, we started working with the travel industry to help them navigate these complexities 
uh, and created a uh, some guidance and guidelines that have uh, have now um, evolved into what are called the uh, ABTA Animal Welfare Guidelines. And these are a series of guides. Um, the, it has a, a main guide, which is the blue one in front of you, um, which provides some basic standards uh, of animal welfare based on the five domains. And then you have additional guides that um, explain the attraction types and uh, guides the, the travel business and their suppliers um, around the complexities of, of those different types of attractions and uh, advises those businesses on how on the kind of um, the kind of facilities they sell and if they sell them what kind of preventative measures need to be in place to protect their customers um, local people's livelihoods uh, and of course the animals themselves. So just taking you through those guides, uh, sanctuaries are, are, uh, are mentioned in the main guide um, and they're generally recognized as a facility that rescues uh, injured, confiscated, orphaned or abandoned animals. Um, and they also recognize the short and long-term element that some animals uh, may be rehabilitated for release, whilst others may have uh, lifetime care. The, um, the guides, uh, as I say, focus on the five domains and recognize those bas basic animal welfare requirements. But then there are also uh, species specific guidance uh, throughout the different guides as well as the, the red guide, which focuses on activities considered unacceptable by the industry, uh, which are based upon um, activities that uh, may be harmful to the animals or harmful to uh, uh, people involved. Certainly when considering uh, the uh, description of sanctuaries and um, the kind of practices that a travel business should expect from a sanctuary, uh, these are very much compatible with the GFAS uh, standards or criteria. Um, a, uh, an un unacceptable practice to uh, breed the animals and also to involve them in commercial trade, but also commercial practices such as uh, selling um, experiences where people can hold an animal for a photographic opportunity uh, or to have some kind of uh, interaction is certainly considered unacceptable um, and uh, largely um, across whether it's a sanctuary or a zoo or indeed uh, viewing animals in the wild there is a strict no physical contact uh, um, advice uh, across um, all, all those types of activities. So these um, ABTA animal welfare guidelines um, were largely created for ABTA members and their suppliers and ABTA being the British Travel uh, Association. But um, ABTA has done really well to get these guidelines out to a global, global audience and have been adopted by a number of other regional travel trade associations uh, and um, numerous travel businesses. So as far as um, my perspective and, and advice that we would like to convey, not just to uh, yourselves listening, um, the, the actual um, uh, sanctuaries themselves, but also to uh, the travel businesses that we work with, clear communication is vital um, from a travel business perspective to make sure that they are communicating to their supplier over the red lines, those um, unacceptable practices such as contact uh, need to be limited or, com or completely uh, not exercised by the supplier. Uh, and equally, the uh, sanctuary needs to be very clear as to 
what their operational uh, rules and requirements are so that the travel business knows what to expect. It's really important that those industry uh, requirements, as I've covered uh, within the ABTA guidelines, um, are recognised and uh, included within the communications uh, so that the travel business has the peace of mind that their customers are not being placed at risk and that the animals are in the best possible care. As was mentioned by a previous uh, presenter, uh, there is a lot of customer expectation around these kind of facilities. And uh, certainly from the experiences I've had uh, in visiting uh, the elephant facilities in Southeast Asia, there is a very high expectation of the customer that they are going to have that direct and personal contact and interaction with an individual animal or a group of animals. And we all know the uh, risks involved in that. Travel businesses are learning of those risks and it would be wrong to assume that they are completely aware. And so again, with your communications to make sure that uh, there is an understanding that you don't offer those direct contact and why, and the fact that you're keen to look after both the health and safety of the customer, but also that of the animals involved. Customer health and safety is a legal requirement on travel businesses, so they will quite often audit facilities, whether that is not through a desk-based process or an in-situ process, to make sure that the activities are, um, are accommodating for their guests and that their guests are not involved in any activity that is likely to cause them um, poor health or injury. And zoonotic disease uh, potential is included within the ABTA guidelines, for example. So they are, um, they are understood and uh, measures are usually in place to mitigate those. As well as the customer experience and expectation, there is generally um, a perception that, you're, that the guests are going to see the animals. And uh, if they go to a facility and it's very difficult to find the animal in the enclosure, for example, that they're in the indoor enclosure or that there's lots of vegetation so you can't actually see the animal, uh, these can cause issues and customer complaints. So again, really important to uh, communicate effectively and ensure that the uh, customer expectation is managed to the degree that they may not see the animals that they may wish to see, and they certainly may not have the access to the animal. They may just see the animals from a distance rather than uh, up close and personal. Many facilities do offer um, behind the scenes or volunteerism ex experiences, um, and some uh, operate with good practice, uh, such as was communicated earlier, um, but others very much uh, operate um, with the experience of the volunteer in mind uh, and offer those direct and personal um, hands-on experiences which certainly would not be considered good practice and again this is would be uh, vital to ensure good communication and uh, the application of industry um, requirements. One way to get around this, uh, this complexity uh, to sort of identify whether, act whether good practices are in place or whether uh, a sanctuary is a true sanctuary or just one in name is to work with accredited or endorsed facilities that have gone through an assessment of their of their operations and have or are, are a member of a, of a particular good practice um, accreditation group um, and um, and, and have the, the relevant accreditation or certification to prove that. Um, GFAS, of course, and PASA both have 
uh, those accreditations and endorsement processes. So um, whilst the travel business may choose to do their own assessment, uh, working with an accredited or an endorsed facility um, has some guarantees. One thing that, uh, that Animundial is doing is to create an animal protection network where we, um, we work with uh, grassroots animal protection projects, and many of these are animal sanctuaries, whilst others are um, uh, uh, nature protection and conservation projects and groups. And what we do is work with um, those grassroots projects, incorporating them into the animal protection network, and then working with travel businesses to um, provide opportunity um, where those uh, experiences could be included within uh, tourism experiences or may benefit from uh, tourism um, uh, corporate social responsibility um, monies or in-kind support. Um, we work with a whole range of different projects and, uh, and types in, in multiple locations. And um, by having an endorsement process ourselves where we sort of review those activities uh, against species specific requirements and activity type, um, our approval uh, stamp that we include on all these facilities is recognized by uh, global travel businesses and uh, travel associations, many that you see on this slide. Uh, and they look for that approval rating um, for that endorsement to incorporate within their, their own offerings uh, and activities. Um, so I certainly would recommend uh, the sanctuaries that are on this call, on this presentation, to um, seek, seek kinds of endorsements such as these, which uh, generally provide the travel business the peace of mind that any bad practice um, is mitigated and that um, there is quality care for the animals and quality experience for, the, for their guests. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Daniel, and thank you for being flexible and, and going out of turn. It is great to hear the perspective of the tourism industry and how we can better communicate what sanctuary really is. Um, okay, we're getting short on time, but I do want to turn it over to Tiffany because we want to hear yes. about her sanctuary experiences. So I'm going to pull up your slides to- Thank you. I apologize for the, <laughs> the hiccup there. Okay. All right, you will right, let perfect. me know when to advance them. Okay, yeah, so um, I'll go ahead to the about me section. I'll do a quick intro here. Um, so I grew up in Cooperstown, New York, and uh, my first real travel experience, I was a Rotary Point Exchange student in Germany, um, and that was right out of high school. So I've always loved traveling, and I've always really wanted to learn more about the world and more about different cultures. Um, I earned my bachelor's in wildlife care and education from a really small school in Maine, and my master's through Miami University's Project Dragonfly Global Field Program. So it's all about traveling to conservation hotspots, which is really cool. Um, I mentioned before, I'm a zookeeper and PASA volunteer, and I'm planning on starting my PhD uh, this year, waiting on acceptance letters <laughs> um, in conservation psychology. I'm gonna go ahead to the next slide. All right, so a little bit more about Project Dragonfly because uh, this crowd might be interested uh, in learning more. So it's basically a program that brings scientists, educators, community leaders, and others together at wildlife conservation hotspots around the world. So it attracts a lot of zookeepers, a lot of conservationists, a lot of teachers that want to teach their students more about wildlife and conservation. Um, so typically in the global field program, uh, every student would go to three different conservation hotspots around the world. So I started in 2019 and in 2020, guess what happened? Everything shut down. <laughs> so I ended up only having one Earth expedition to Belize, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and then I did my other two courses online. So a major benefit to this program is the networking. So I have so many contacts at um, places around the world, which 
I wouldn't have had without it. So now when I want to travel to Namibia, even though my trip got canceled a week before I was supposed to go, I can just reach out and say, hey, will you take me? Can I volunteer? What can I do? Um, so networking is a huge benefit. And um, every student would focus on a different conservation topic. So mine was primate conservation education. And that kind of helped lead me here to call this conservation now. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so Belize, this was uh, the only trip, as I mentioned, that I went with through grad school. So there were about 14 of us. And we're based at the Belize Zoo and Tropical Education Center. Uh, this zoo is it's just incredible. Um, so they do a lot of field work, a lot of conservation work. Um, so one thing that we worked on with them is the taper vehicle collision prevention program. So um, as with a lot of wildlife, uh, crossing highways is dangerous and it ends up killing them. So they have a big awareness campaign going on, uh, similar to what's going on here at Call This Conservation, asking people to slow down, to be aware that there's animals that are on that road. Um, and then and this was kind of like a sampler program. Um, so we learned about their Jaguar rehabilitation program. So Belize, there's a lot of Jaguars in the area where the zoo is. So they would take them in, rehabilitate them and then release them when possible and then um, have it sanctuary for the ones that couldn't be released. And we went to the community baboon sanctuary, which um, is actually howler monkeys, not baboons. It's just the Creole name for them. Um, so we learned about how the community as a whole um, prides themselves on uh, these baboons and then having, um, sorry, I'm just what we kept calling them, uh, the howler monkeys. And um, so they have a big education program and they ask people to come and to learn about them. Um, there is no facility where injured animals would live there. It's just all in the wild, which is really cool. Um, so we helped do a um, tobacco key beach cleanup project. So you can see the bottom picture there. We ended up making a little graph uh, on the different types of things that we found. There's a lot of textiles, a lot of plastic as you would expect. Um, and then we worked with uh, manatee visual surveys and then also coral reef ecology. So it was just a lot of different things learning all about Belize and learning all about the different approaches that they have to environmental stewardship. Um, all right, next slide. Sweetwater's Chimpanzee Sanctuary. Um, so this is a possum member sanctuary. Um, you can see in that map there, that's Old Pejita. And then Sweetwater's is part of that. So it's that little circle there. Um, so I was planning on volunteering with them, but due to COVID, in-person volunteering was no longer the safest option uh, for the chimps. And uh, as mentioned before, that's the most important thing. Anywhere you should be going, if that's not the most important thing, it's a red flag. Um, so animal welfare, animal care, animal health, that's what everything should be about. Um, so I decided to switch focus um, and volunteer with Olpechita and learn more about rhinos. And then I'll definitely have those connections for future volunteer opportunity. Um, so next slide. A little bit about Olpechita Conservancy. Uh, I did their immersive conservation volunteer program and along with me in that first picture, you can see three students on their gap year. Um, so these are people who were interested in con conservation. One of them is very interested in politics um, and they were all coming to learn more about conservation. So I think it's important to note that you, you don't have to be a zookeeper like me or specifically in the animal care field or have any real conservation background in order to volunteer and make a difference. So a lot of these programs are set up to teach you and to help you learn so we can go and teach other people. Um, so this was, again, a sampler volunteer experience. So I got to see all kinds of different things about rhinos. Um, so the opportunities included uh, lion monitoring, black rhino and southern white rhino tracking, grevy zebra medical care, uh, working with the anti-poaching canine unit, working with the last two northern white rhinos on the planet. That's a really uh, humbling experience. Um, and because of my animal care background, most of, most of this was animal focused. Um, and all Petita and most other ethical opportunities are going to work to match your individual skill set to what they need as an organization. So if my background was maintenance or if it was photography, um, I can reach out and say, hey, this is what I'm good at. Can I help you? And they say, hey, maybe we need this or we need that. And you just kind of find the best, best fit for you. All right, next slide. I'm almost done, I swear. So travel planning tips. I just wanted to share a little bit about what I've learned as a volunteer. Uh, the biggest one, you don't have to do it alone and you shouldn't do it alone. There are so many different trusted organizations out there that have already researched these um, ethical travel opportunities. So um, I really like Conservation Matters in Kenya. Um, they, there's a lot of just different opportunities they can connect you with. Whatever you're interested in, you just share that info and we'll kind of plug 
you in to, to where you fit best. Um, and I also look at PASA member sanctuaries or um, GFAS accredited sanctuaries. If I'm going to a zoo, I look at Association of Zoos and Aquariums accredited. All about that accreditation, I'm looking at places that have already been verified as good and safe. And then you look a little bit further, but it's kind of a safety net almost to know that they are good ethical plays. Um, so, and continue to learn from your past experiences, good and bad. So if you go somewhere that you're like, hey, this is questionable, you may have thought it was great ahead of time. And then you say, hey, maybe I should look for um, where the primates live or what the contact is with primates, do a little bit more research. So uh, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, learn from it and uh, you can really make the experience the best that it can be. Okay, next slide. So thank you for listening. I just wanted to share with you uh, some social media contacts and some on PASA's social media team um, that you can follow in addition to GPAS, um, which I'm assuming everybody knows about since you're joining this webinar today. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I'm glad we were able to get through your presentation. And it's great to hear that regardless of your um, skills or experience, there are volunteer opportunities for you. So I know we've, we've run a few minutes late, but there are a couple of questions. So I'm going to hand it over to Jean now. OK, let's see. Yes. We've had uh, lots of questions come in, which is awesome. Thank you, everybody. Um, and I see Daniel is uh, very kindly answering some in chat as well around the, um, there was a question around um, the wildlife trafficking and uh, what's up with the laws. <laughs> Aren't there laws against that? And, and how rigorous is the enforcement? And as Daniel has mentioned there, it's, it's quite variable how rigorous that is or not. Um, and I would invite um, any of our panelists, uh, but especially Anna and Kareen, probably have a great perspective on that being uh, where they are at the epicenter of a lot of it. If you have a point of view you'd like to share, Anna or Kareen, on that one. Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, it's, it's similar to what Daniel said with the there's international and national laws. And so, I mean, what with our experience here in Guatemala, they have a lot of laws in place. It is illegal to have a native animal in your possession without a permit. And so they have to have specific permits that um, anyone has. So if you have a parrot, you have to have a permit for that species of parrot. And the government does come up and check. And so with certain private collections that do have animals, the government will randomly turn up and do an inventory and be able to see that all the animals there match up with the permits that are allowed. Same thing, they do the same thing to us as well. Um, What's happened over the last few years is that with the penalties for um, confiscated animals and ones that are actually properly arrested and go to court, they um, were being heard, the same court cases were being heard in the same room as sort of murder charges, drug charges, rape charges, and then it will be someone that has a parrot. And so the judge would often just pass it through and it wasn't actually getting a lot of the penalties that it should have or the, the, the legal um, respect. And so what's happened here and where actually just where we are across the lake from where we are, um, they set up a specific wildlife court. And so there is a wildlife judge and she will only hear wildlife cases. And so she's lovely. Um, and uh, we've been in a lot of contact with her. So she asked how much does it cost to raise a baby monkey through all our rehabilitation processes to release, to look at fines and how to uh, work out the, the different fining for those penalties. Um, she comes in contact with us a lot as to all those sort of different things and allocates them properly. And they actually do the court cases here. So we don't take the animals as evidence to the courthouse. They bring the whole court to us and record it and do it all here. So it's the least stressful for the animal itself. So it's, there's always both sides. So at the moment we're struggling a lot with getting receiving confiscations because the government doesn't have a huge amount of money and that's stretched thin obviously with COVID. And so they don't do as many raids, they don't do as many sort of border checks as they used to do because of that stretch thin with money. And so um, there's always gonna be good side and bad side and it just depends, it can always improve. You'll always get needs for improvement in the legal wildlife trade, but there are some things being done. So um, that's, that's the Guatemalan perspective. I don't know if anyone else in other countries have a different perspective on it. Yeah, thank you, that's amazing, yeah. Karine. Thank you. Um, I can say that um, the Kugama is working together with the National Protected Area Authority 
uh, that has the mandate to uh, do the confiscation of the chimps uh, that are raised as pets. So we cannot go there uh, alone, uh, but uh, we always work together. Uh, if it's uh, with the patrols in the national park and other national parks that we are co-managing at the moment, and if it's in the confiscation uh, process. Um, and of course, well, <laughs> in Sierra Leone, there is uh, a law saying that it's illegal to raise uh, a chimpanzee as a pet, but it's not being enforced besides the efforts that Takugama is doing together with the NPAA. Thank you. Um, and I happen to know that you've taken in many, many orphans uh, this year at Takugama, so uh, I know the need is quite acute. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Karine, we've got another question for you. This is from Philip Anderson Samora, who is uh, a Sierra Leonean who's studying in Rwanda. And he asks, um, what is the impact of the ecotourism sec sector on the communities that are close to Takagama? He mentions Regent Bathurst, Char Charlotte. Um, and I would imagine that's a relevant question as well in Guatemala or any place else. Uh, but Karim, why don't you start with that one? Sure, hello, Philip. Um, so first, as I said uh, in my presentation, uh, we are uh, hiring from the nearby communities to uh, have a stronger connection with, uh, with those communities because of course it's not easy uh, that there is a conflict there right uh, we are using the national park uh, area for the sanctuary and also protecting um, the rest of the area um, and this is land that um, has been in conflict with communities around um, that wants to build their houses there, that wants to use it for their own benefit. So we do believe in uh, working together. So the, the first and kind of more most uh, immediate one is the income generation. Uh, the, we are uh, trying to hire staff that are from the nearby communities. Second, we are also working uh, with awareness raising. We have a, a youth group, uh, Roots and Shoots, uh, that is a program that was developed by the Jen Goodall Institute uh, with the nearby communities. Uh, we have community events and sessions about conservation and environment education. Uh, so also trying to enforce the relationship with the youth. Thank you, that is so great. Uh, and I think I saw one other question in there. Yeah, this is a question about um, kind of the value of accreditation um, and maybe Jackie could speak to, uh, the question is what does, how much does it cost for sanctuaries to become accredited and do they find it worthwhile? Um, so Jackie, perhaps you wanna speak from the GFAS perspective? Well, we do have an application fee. It's a sliding fee. It's on our website. I'm happy to talk directly to anyone who is interested in it. Um, and of course, you know, among the benefits of accreditation or verification from us is, as we've learned in the webinar today, um, that status, that, that signal to the public, to the tourist industry, that you are a true sanctuary, um, that you have been vetted in terms of your safety, your care of your animals, and that you are a true sanctuary. And of course, um, we also give opportunities for our sanctuaries to network with each other, learn from each other, which is something that is very important for us. Yeah, I would, I would echo that for sure from the PASA perspective. Um, we also are a accrediting body for the, our members. They go through a fairly rigorous process that can take um, any, quite, quite some time, a couple of years uh, generally is pretty normal. Um, and there is a fee associated with it. And uh, similar to GFAS, we will work with our members to, to make sure that that's affordable for them. Um, and we, we, we try to make sure that we're providing networking opportunities. We run vet care uh, trainings and uh, different chances for people to learn from each other, share resources. We can do fundraising for our members as well. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that we try to support them. Uh, that's our main, our main goal in life is to be their backbone of support. Um, and 
as the last two years of going through a global pandemic. And I think this is probably true for every single sanctuary that's affiliated with either of our organizations. It's been a really rough ride. Um, people are tired. They've been on site for uh, for years. They have some of them. We were talking with one yesterday. She, has, she hasn't been off her off of her property in two years. Um, and their staff, the local staff, uh, many of them sheltered in place during the, the height of the pandemic and were away from their families. And uh, so enormous uh, sacrifice that went through that time. And as we heard um, for from both Karina and Anna that uh, the volunteer programs, the ecotourism programs are a huge portion of how uh, some sanctuaries are uh, funding their operations. So the loss of that has been immense. Um, so I think, I think those are our questions and uh, yeah, I'll turn it back to Jackie. Okay, well, um, we've gone over an hour and it seems like we're just starting to really talk about this issue. There's so much more we could talk about, but hopefully this has been a start for everyone to think about what we can do, whether as sanctuaries to communicate um, the visitor opportunities or ways to communicate uh, what a true sanctuary is. And for those of you interested in visiting or volunteering, uh, the volunteering, volunteering. <laughs> um, nice to, it is a nice new word. Thank you. Um, to, to know what to look for, for, for a good experience that doesn't exploit animals and puts them first. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much to our presenters today. Thank you again, everybody. Um, we will go ahead and get everybody that attended a link probably next week to the recording along with the link where you can download the full slide presentation. So thank you again to the presenters and to all of the attendees. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.